Hi, everybody. Nate Eaton here with EastIdahoNews.com. We are talking with a few people who work with the Eastern Idaho Public Health Department. They're answering your questions today about COVID-19. There's been so many of you that have asked questions. We're going to go to Jerry Rakow. We, of course, are doing this via video conference so that we can uh, social distance from each other. Jerry, I guess the first question we have, you're the director of the Eastern Idaho Public Health Department District. What do you guys do? What, what, what's your ultimate goal and purpose? Well, that's a great question, Nate. And um, most people don't understand um, what public health does until a situation like this brings our work to the forefront. Um, in the state of Idaho, there are seven independent public health districts, and Eastern Idaho Public Health covers Bonneville, Clark, Custer, Fremont, Jefferson, Lemhi, Madison, and Teton counties, so the eight counties in Eastern Idaho. Um, in normal day-to-day -day business, we you know, we're doing inspections of restaurants. Our goal is to help make sure that our people in our communities are safe and, and healthy. And so we, we do environmental health work, we issue septic permits, we uh, inspect restaurants, we administer the women's infant and children or the WIC program, um, we do immunizations, we do reproductive health services. And one of our major programs is public health preparedness. And that's what you're seeing um, right here on the front lines as we're handling this um, pandemic of COVID-19. Um, when when um, the public health role, and I just wanna to say too that most people are confused that we are the Department of Health and Welfare and we are not. We are an independent organization. We have a local governing board that's made out of a representative from county commissioners from all of our eight counties. And again, in the state, there are seven independent health districts but we all work closely together and we coordinate very closely with the Department of Health and Welfare at the state level. Okay, so what is the latest today that you can give us any sort of update on COVID-19 uh, cases here in Eastern Idaho? All right, in Eastern Idaho for our eight, three cases that are confirmed. And what Sorry, that, you, you cut out one more time. How many cases? We have 23 laboratory confirmed cases in our eight county health district region. And what that means is that an individual has um, gone to see their health care provider. Um, they determined that um, they needed to be tested for COVID-19. Um, they took a sample. That sample was sent off to a lab somewhere, um, either the Idaho Bureau of Laboratory in Boise or, or a commercial lab. And when that test was um, tested positive, that's when we as the public health district get involved in the process. Um, okay. So we'll talk a little bit more about tests here in a minute, but first can we touch on the mask uh, update or suggestions that came out over the weekend from the CDC? Is that something Eastern Idaho Public Health is advocating for as well? Yeah, that's a great question, Nate. And um, you're right, on Friday, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, did release new guidelines, updated guidelines, um, that is encouraging individuals uh, to wear face, cloth face coverings. And we call them masks, but it, we really want to differentiate that it is not the, the surgical masks or the N95 masks that healthcare professionals really need, because there is a shortage of those personal protective equipment, is what they're referred to. Um, the, the cloth face coverings is what the CDC is recommending, not as a replacement for doing the social distancing effort. So staying away from people, you know, washing your hands frequently, uh, all of that stuff, that's still in place. It's just to augment that um, because there is some indication um, as, as we gather more data about COVID-19 that it's possible that someone could be infectious before they begin showing symptoms. And so the purpose of the cloth face covering is not to prevent an individual from getting sick with COVID. It is if that person um, is infectious to prevent others from being exposed to those um, germs that are dispelled one from one's body. So it's, it's to pr protect others. It's not necessarily to protect yourself. Um, we want to be really cautious while we're encouraging that. When, when you put something on your face, I think most people are more inclined to touch your face more frequently, whether you're you know, fiddling with the mask, making sure it's positioned properly. So it does um, potentially create more opportunity for germs to be infected. And so people really need to be 
um, doing a good job of still washing their hands and still not touching their face or their nose or, you know, to, to, that would still infect, infect people that way. And this is wearing the masks if you need to go to the grocery store or need to, you know, go to a public place, right? Not around your house or if you're going on a walk. Right. And it is, um, the recommendation was that um, people that have to go out to places where social distancing is a little more challenging um, and that there's community transmission, um, that those are the areas that people would be wearing masks when you go outside of your home. Jerry, the, the president and I believe Dr. Fauci said that this is gonna be a rough week nationwide for these cases, that the numbers aren't, uh, at least they don't predict them to be very good. Any sort of prediction here in Eastern Idaho? Are we gonna see a, a big explosion of numbers this week? Any idea? Yeah, I wish I had a crystal ball that would give us that answer. But in, in Idaho, we are a little bit behind some of the other hot spots in the nation. So while I do expect that the cases in our, in our area, in our state will continue to increase, um, I don't think we're going to see um, the number of deaths explode like what is maybe being projected in some of the area areas around the nation. Um, it doesn't mean that we're we're not going to continue to see increased cases in our health district and unfortunately we we anticipate that we will have some deaths um, as well at some point in the future. Part of the challenge is, is trying to know when that future point is and the state of Idaho has been working with um, representatives from our, our state universities to work on some modeling that is specific to Idaho to help us all have a better idea of, of when, um, when we might see the peak in Idaho, you know, how long this is gonna last, um, and, and try to give us a better idea of what we can plan for the future as we go into the peak and as we come out of, of this pandemic um, here locally. And we're expecting that to be released you know, in the coming days. Um, certainly there's other models out there that um, people have access to, um, but trying to use data and information specific to Idaho is what they're doing to try to give us the best idea possible of what we can anticipate here. Well, hopefully those numbers continue to be lower. Uh, there with Jerry is James Corbett. He also works with the Department of Health. And we have several of your questions that you all watching submitted to us. So, so James, if you're ready, I'm going to ask some of these questions to you. They're, they're social distancing, so he's going to slide in the shot there yeah, right. and take some of these. Uh, James, this is, this is one of the questions we've been asked a lot, as I'm sure you guys have. It's about testing. And this person says, why are you not directing anyone that's suspected of being infected to be tested? Because of this, there is underreporting of the virus in our community. This creates a false sense of security, and there are still whole families going out into the community thinking it's not that bad here. So why, why can't suspected people, be, cases, be tested? So certainly, um, first, we appreciate your time to help us be able to educate the public. And I want to just say that everyone wishes that there were more testing. There isn't an individual or a partner involved in this that doesn't wish that we could provide more testing. But there's a few reasons why um, that may or may not be the case. So we'll get into that. Uh, certainly, if individuals are sick enough, they are, at the clinician's discretion, able to be tested. Now, that will be determined by the provider, a medical provider. Um, but with the uh, constraint on not only the testing, but then testing supplies, as well as PPE and other medical resources, it's not just about the lack of testing, it's uh, also those other supplies that we're trying to conserve for maybe a potential peak uh, later on, so to help protect those healthcare workers. So um, again, it, the clinician has that ability to test if they would like to, but they are being asked to you know, have those other factors in their mind when they choose whether or not to test that individual. The other part of that is if the course of treatment will not change based on the testing. So while some cases are severe and we do not want to downplay that at all, there a majority of individuals um, that we know will have mild symptoms that can recover at home. And because of that, we're asking individuals to uh, not change their their life or it, you know understanding that they're a positive COVID-19 uh, case from a laboratory report 
will not change necessarily the course of treatment for that individual. So those that do change the course of treatment, such as hospitalized patients or individuals with underlying health conditions that may be you know, progressing towards hospitalization, or healthcare workers that are caring for those individuals are going to be prioritized at many locations um, or testing sites. So James, there's been some talk about these rapid tests that are being developed that you can find out the results within hours or even minutes maybe. Um, do you foresee that maybe come, coming here? And I guess at that point, maybe more people could then be tested. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, certainly we'll eventually be able to get more uh, testing done, both from a lab perspective and some of those rapid tests that you do, and potentially even some of the antibody testes, which I'm sure some of the individuals out there are wondering about as well. That's the blood test. That will just show whether you've been exposed to it or not. Those times will come. Um, it's important to know that this is, we're, you know, two months into this into the United States, and this is a rapidly changing situation. So those tests can't be manufactured overnight. Um, they're being prioritized where there are, you know, quote unquote, hot spots across the nation to help them, uh, you know, protect their healthcare workers and their infrastructure to be able to care for those individuals. Uh, certainly as manufacturing is able to catch back up, we will certainly get those in uh, Eastern Idaho. We do not have a timeline for that though. Okay, yeah, that was my next question. So as of now, the antibody test is not available here. Correct. Okay. Um, and I would, one more thing on testing. Sure. I think it's important to note that um, you asked uh, that we're underreporting. Certainly, what we can report is just the number of cases that do test positive. Our messaging has been that COVID-19 is here. We want individuals to take this seriously and to uh, do those things necessary to protect them and their families and their, their loved ones. We do not want to ever, what we are able to report is the number of laboratory reported cases. That's a number that we have. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, we can't report uh, just individuals that maybe were turned away from a provider's office uh, or that maybe were told that they have symptoms consistent with COVID-19 and to stay home. And, uh, but we can report laboratory reported cases, but we don't want that to be the only number in people's mind. There are other cases out there. We are you know, quite sure of it. We just don't have confirmation of that. So. And that's why you are encouraging people to stay home because exactly. if you do have it and you're at home, even if you haven't been tested. Uh, so no shortage thus far of tests here or the PPE, the, the equipment for medical providers? Well, I think that you'll uh, certainly, a sh that's kind of a broad question about shortage. Certainly we're prioritizing individuals to help maintain uh, an adequate supply for both hospitals and other providers so that they can continue their work we don't want to put them in a position where they would have to start choosing. I see. So we're, if individuals aren't going to be changed from their course of treatment, we want um, them to be adhering to those uh, doctor's orders as well as our guidance about staying home for seven days, a minimum of seven days since the symptom onset, and as well as three days of subsiding symptoms and with no fever. So. That is the guidelines that we have been uh, under for the last few weeks with East Toronto Public Health. If individuals are symptomatic with uh, uh, that, that are consistent or symptoms that are consistent with COVID-19, again, cough, fever, shortness of breath are the three main ones. Uh, we want them to be staying at home for, again, that minimum of seven days since the symptoms began and as well as three days uh, since the symptoms have subsided. So um, that can get, that's been getting confused with the 14 days of isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, 14 days of isolation is if you've been in contact with someone who is a confirmed case or that they are showing signs of, or, or symptoms of uh, consistent with COVID-19. So if you're asymptomatic or without symptoms, that's where you're gonna be in self-isolation for 14 days. And if you're symptomatic, or, or have symptoms, cough, fever, shortness of breath, with COVID-19, that's when we're going to put you under that seven and three, seven, a minimum of seven days and three days with no fever and symptoms subsided.
All right, a couple of Facebook questions about the actual virus. Uh, could you get it? Or th this person says, this winter I know many of my friends and family who were sick, all of the same symptoms of COVID-19. No one could figure out why. Influenza tests were negative. One of them was hospitalized. They still had no answers. Could this have been corona months ago? Also, how long does corona last on different surfaces? Paper, cl clothes, hard surfaces, etc. Yeah, both great questions. So the first, oh, we'll tackle the first one. Uh, I can't say with 100% certainty that that wasn't a coronavirus. Um, if they had travel over to China, we know that the first cases were reported in China, uh, middle of December of 2019. Uh, so if they theoretically traveled, that certainly it's a possibility. But there, I would also say that there are many viruses that circulate annually that can cause cases even up to pneumonia that we don't have necessarily uh, readily available tests for or that they're not necessarily uh, going to be tested because again, the course of treatment with viruses uh, don't always change. So they're, um, if they can, again, even before COVID-19, I wanna stress this, that we recommend that individuals stay home when they're sick, wash hands frequently, um, cover your cough and sneezes appropriately into your sleeve, into your sleeve or into a, uh, a tissue and then washing your hands. Um, all of those are good, sound advice, uh, no matter the situation or no matter the year that we're facing. Um, it just so happens that we have a heightened awareness around COVID-19 with that. So um, while I can't, again, to, wrap, to reiterate that, I can't say for 100% certainty, but there are other potential causes as well and probably more likely causes. And how about it lasting on surfaces? Yeah, so that's a great question. Again, this while this virus is so new, there has been some initial studies. Um, the one that's most commonly quoted and what we'll use here is up to three days on you know, steel and plastic, um, up to a day on cardboard. Uh, they even use copper. Copper is a new uh, thing that, some, that has some uh, you know, antiviral or antimicrobial pro uh, properties. It stayed uh, on there for four hours. Um, the biggest question we get asked that is clothing. How long can it stay on clothing? There have not been studies that have been able to, to do that yet. So what we're recommending is that individuals, again, be careful. Um, wash your hands frequently, even after touching. You don't know where the virus has been. But uh, I think it's important to note that even with those, uh, the clothing, most normal uh, washing will be able to take care of that. They recommend warm water, uh, if at all possible, and, and washing those clothes appropriately. But you don't necessarily have to be overly concerned if you went on a walk outside and then come back. But if you've gone to a place where you weren't able to uh, social distance, then it might be appropriate to do some clothing out of an abundance of caution. Again, we don't have the studies necessarily because of the viral virus being so new to fully confirm what we know. Is it possible to get COVID-19 more than once? Let's say you get it this spring and there's a resurgence in the fall. Will we be looking at this again in the fall? Yeah, certainly uh, that, that question or the answer to that will depend on a few different subjects. If everyone is exposed to it and develops either immunity, um, we would not likely see a bump in the fall. But if there's most cases that it kind of wanes, it could make a resurgence in the uh, you know, unaffected individuals or the individuals that don't have immunity built up to that. We don't, to your original question, we don't understand fully yet because again, this virus is so new and I hate to not provide you know, concrete answers, but, and I know it can be concerning for a lot of individuals to not hear concrete answers, but a lot of times with this virus being so new, we don't have concrete answers. It is possible that individuals could catch this again, but it is likely that they will have immunity to this for at least a while. It wouldn't be that uh, you catch it and then two weeks later you're able to maybe catch it again. So, Which is one of the reasons why they're, they're strongly trying to find a vaccine for this, right? That even yes, absolutely. If you catch it again. 
Yeah. Uh, one other Facebook question. How many of the fatalities in Idaho, and, and, and uh, you might not know this, and, and maybe nobody does, but how many of the fatalities in Idaho have been attributed to complications from COVID-19 can be documented to have been the result of corona rather than just the death of someone who also tested positive for corona? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and I can't speak to it, as you mentioned. Um, partially due to two facts. One, we don't have an individual death here in Eastern Idaho Public Health's um, eight county region. The second reason is that while they had tested positive for coronavirus, there could have been other um, situations that also, uh, or comorbidities as we call them, other reasons why they also are in that situation. So uh, with 100% certainty, we can't determine that, but we do uh, document it on, and coroners will do this, they'll document that the person individual tested positive for COVID-19 if there is a death. James, what misconceptions, misinformation, fake news are you seeing out there that you want to clear up? Yeah, well, I think some individuals have, have brought up the question about uh, we, uh, why uh, younger or, you know, normal, healthy adults uh, have been getting this. Certainly, it's never, uh, we never want to tell anyone that they don't have a chance of getting this virus. Everyone, young or old, has the ability to, to catch this virus or to uh, contract this virus. But the individuals with underlying health conditions or as we found through most of the studies, those that ha are increasing in age have more susceptibility for the severe cases of this uh, thing. So we need to do our part, both young and old, to help stop the spread. And again, obeying the stay at home order, uh, washing our hands, doing those things that will help prevent the spread to other individuals. But we, that will help prevent that from getting to those individuals with underlying health conditions or that are increasing in age. Is the media sensationalizing this? No, certainly uh, the history will be able to tell us that, right? Right, yeah. So, <laughs> but until that time comes, we have to act on the worst possible scenarios. And we continue to prepare and plan with our partners for those potential scenarios. Um, as, as individuals have been able to see across the nation and across the world, this can be a severe and an impactful um, situation for many individuals. And we don't want to lose lives. We want to protect everyone. So in that case, we want the media to make sure that they get out factual information and the seriousness of this and for people to, again, do those things that will help pr protect them and their families. But uh, that will be the most important thing. And that is not why the media is sensationalizing it, in my opinion. Yeah. All right, James, anything you want to add? No, I, we appreciate your time and helping to get it. We would, again, ask all this information, again, is on our website, uh, eiph.idaho.gov, including a decision tree that will help people walk through if they are symptomatic or have symptoms and what they should do, or if they've been in contact with someone who has, who has symptoms. Is, um, is, oh, go ahead. Well, no, both of those... Uh, uh, in that decision tree, both of those scenarios are, are gone through, as well as it has information for our hotline that they're able to call or go through our website that has an email that they can refer, uh, ask questions, as well as get on our Facebook page. Great, and we will link to all of those. Is Jerry still there in the room? Absolutely. Uh, Jerry, I, I wanna ask you, uh, you've, you've dealt with a lot of health things over the years have, have you seen anything quite like this i don't think anyone has yeah. and and is the media being responsible at least locally in in reporting this do we need to do more do we need to tamper down what, what are your thoughts no that it is a question that um that all of us are struggling with that it is an unprecedented um situation that none of us have experienced with before and we're learning as we go and I would say that I think our local media has been very responsive. Um, we as public health are saying, okay, are we, are we putting out too much information and trying to temper that with the information that people are ready to receive? 
but I think you'll I think you'll agree that you know when it hits home to someone, people are much more eager to hear information, and we have information on our website, and we are appreciative of partners like you and uh, our other local media that are helping us to get out factual information about the situation. And like you said, we don't have all the answers, um, but as soon as we have answers, we're going to be sharing them. Is there any misinformation you want to clear up? I asked James that question, but anything you've seen or any message that you want to get out to the public that you can just stress here right now? So a couple of things, you know, complying with the stay home order is of utmost importance right now. And the whole point of that was to help slow down the spread of the illness. Uh, we know that we're not necessarily going to stop the illness. And in, in Idaho Falls and in Eastern Idaho, again, we're, we've been on the, the later tail end of what we're seeing across the state and the nation. So we're going to have to continue those measures for some point until which time we do hit our peak, and we will eventually. Um, we just don't know exactly at this point what it is. We are monitoring with hospitals to help try to identify what they're seeing in ER visits uh, to give us a better idea of what's happening locally. Um, but we do know at some point we're going to hit that peak. But complying with the order and, you know, it's being asked to be voluntary voluntary compliance. That's what we all need to do. Be doing the right thing so that we can all help slow the spread. And the whole goal of that is to ensure that we have the needed healthcare capacity in our hospitals to deal with those patients that are going to need that extra care. Um, the second thing is, and, and I know I've seen from many of the Facebook comments that um, the numbers are being underreported. And the challenge with that is the lack of testing capability and having to prioritize that for, for those most at risk um, is limiting our ability to really have factual numbers of how many cases we're seeing in our region. Just because we say we only have 23 cases, that does not mean that we don't have it more widespread in our community. And we want everyone to realize that, that we've been, we've been talking about and now in several of our counties have confirmed community-wide um, community transmission of it, which means someone contracted the illness and they don't, we can't track it back to where. So it's spreading in the community. Um, I will, I do want to say, because I get this question a lot, when we get it, a positive case, we have until this point been able to, up, up to this point through all of our cases, we're able to identify all the contacts of that individual and we reach out to them, we monitor them, we provide them with information. So those people are not out there spreading it more. And that's something that I think may be a mis misperception. Um, but we have to assume that um, coronavirus, COVID-19 is widespread in our communities. And that's why we're asking, don't rely on the numbers that are printed on our website for the confirmed cases because of the challenges that we've had in our state and the nation uh, with testing capacity um, we know that there's likely more cases out there. We just don't have a way to document them. Okay. Well, we, again, we'll put those links to the uh, Eastern Idaho Public Health Department division um, that you can check out the information for yourself. Jerry Rackow, thank you so much. James Corbett, thank you so much. And we will continue to bring you the updates every day as they come in. And hopefully we're uh, not going to see a big explosion here as, as many uh -huh. national May I just say one more thing? Every day we're doing a daily report on our website, um, announcing new cases, um, giving some education, you know, just kind of giving the scenario as we know it. So I just encourage everyone, we're trying to get that updated by five o'clock every day. It's right on the top of our website that people can go there and, and read the latest um, at, that we know um, at the end of each day. All right. Thank you, Gary, and thank you all for watching. Thanks.